Good evening, and welcome, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight. My name is Sandra De Castro Buffington, and I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society, a program at the Norman Lear Center based at the University of Southern California in the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. We arrived from Los Angeles just a week after Freedom Day. And when we landed, we were taken directly from the airport to the home of Nelson Mandela. We were not invited guests. We were simply stopping by to pay our respects to one of the greatest leaders of our time. It was late, and we could see through the floor-to-ceiling windows of his home an image of Mandela and his wife, and we felt as if we were in his presence. We quickly realized it was really a painting lining the wall of a grand room. Mandela's living example of unity over separation is a roadmap to a new way of living for the world. And tonight, we're going to talk about another kind of unity, that of public health with entertainment media. We're so ple pleased to bring together this extraordinary group of experts for this panel discussion about how TV reaches global audiences on health. This panel is part of a larger endeavor to bring Hollywood writers and producers to South Africa to learn about global health in a local context. Our group has just spent four full days visiting clinics and hospitals and meeting people who were kind enough, kind enough to tell us their stories. It was so inspiring, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot of creative output from this visit. As many of you know, today there is a growing trend in entertainment to look around the world for information and stories. Writers worldwide are investigating topics of global reach, exploring the ways that different countries and cultures interact and affect one another. And tonight, we have some of the greatest talent from South Africa and from the United States. These master storytellers are here to speak with you about the ways they portray health topics in entertainment storylines and how entertainment media can reach viewers about health. So we're going to start the program uh, with a talk about the Hollywood Health and Society program. And when I finish that, I'll introduce our panelists. And then we'll hear from each one of them. And we'll see short clips of their work from TV and film. So I'm going to talk about stories that change lives. And one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Zoanne Clack, at Grey's Anatomy, she's a co-executive producer of the series, says that dramatic storytelling is about great stories with powerful characters and meaningful themes. And these great stories communicate simple truths that reflect the dimensions of the human soul. And the powerful char characters help us understand our lives. Their stories reflect our core values. And meaningful themes universalize the human experience and help the audience relate. So Hollywood Health and Society harnesses the power of entertainment media to improve health and well-being through storytelling. Oui. I'm going to fall off this <laughs> platform. We've been funded for the last nine years by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we also have funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the California Endowment, and a number of other government funding streams. So how do we work? This is, these are the basic elements of our model. We do outreach to the entertainment industry in these six ways, and I'll show you some highlights of them. We also do outreach to the public, outreach to policymakers. We do research and evaluation, and we have a very lively relationship with our advisory board. So one form of outreach is through briefings and consultations with writers. We're a free resource to the entertainment industry. So they come to us with inquiries about health topics for their storylines, and we will get them access to any medical expert they need on any health topic. 
So we're not focused on, we don't have a single agenda. We just represent health very broadly. Uh, in a 12-month period from 2009 to 2010, we responded to 374 inquiries from writers and producers in Hollywood. We also do proactive outreach to the industry. So we call them and, and pitch topics to them. And if they're interested, we'll take an expert right into the writers' rooms. And sometimes we'll get a group of 20 writers and producers around a table with one medical expert who'll brief them for an hour. Uh, in that 12-month period, we consulted with 38 shows across 16 different networks. There's some examples here. And most importantly, uh, we confirmed 163 storylines that we consulted on that were actually aired during that 12-month period. Another way we do outreach is through panel discussions, very much like this one. And we focus on specific health topics. So here's some examples. Uh, we address the topic of addiction, of global health, of organ transplantation. Never say die, five simple ways to save a life. And we also have a speaker series for the show, the reality show, Intervention. I don't know if that is aired here. It's a, it's a show about um, intervening um, in the addictive process. Another way we reach writers with medical information is through tip sheets. And so this one's on obesity, but we have them on a really wide range of health topics. And these tip sheets are cleared by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They're posted on their entertainment webpage, and they're also posted on ours. And we hand them out to writers. We also have a reel-to-reel -reel newsletter that goes to 800 writers quarterly. And so we, we actually rip headlines from the news about health, and we summarize these stories in two sentences with really uh, kind of engaging titles. And there are web links so that if the writer gets engaged in the story, they can follow it and, and read the whole article. And another thing that writers ask us for are real stories of real people. We never tell a writer what to write. We respect them as master storytellers. They're experts in their own right. But we do take them case studies and real stories for inspiration. And when they get engaged, they'll go along with us, they'll do research, have our experts come in, and they work to make their stories more compelling by making the stories more believable and accurate. And finally, we have an annual Sentinel for Health Awards ceremony to recognize exemplary TV health storylines. So last year, uh, the primetime drama award winner was the show Army Wives, and we'll see a clip from Army Wives tonight. But that one was on diabetes, and the primetime minor storyline awarded was private practice for childhood schizophrenia. And there was a Sesame Workshop, one for a story about how uh, financial, the financial downturn has impacted children and families. And the global health storyline on Law and Order uh, SVU was about rape as a weapon of war in Congo. So we do outreach to the public as well. Go back. In five different ways. And the main one is through TV health storylines. And this is just an example. I don't know if any of you have seen House, but House MD is uh, the most popular drama in the world right now. And it reaches 81 million viewers. The Bold and the Beautiful, one of the longest running soap operas in the world, reaches 300 million viewers in 110 countries. And Desperate Housewives, the number one comedy, reaches 56 million viewers a day. So as you can imagine, you know, if we can get accurate health content into these stories, it can do a lot of good for a lot of people. So let's take a look at an example. Um, this is from the show ER. And we took this um, doctor, Dr. Atul Gawande, who is a Harvard-trained surgeon, and he's a full-time staff writer with The New Yorker magazine. And we took him to meet with the writers of ER. And he did a wonderful briefing. He started out telling a story. And we actually coach our medical experts in telling stories to begin with. And he had the writers so engaged. And then he began to talk about his work with the World Health Organization on something called the Surgical Safety Checklist. And it's a little piece of paper you can fold up and put in your pocket. It takes two minutes to use.
before starting surgery. And it is, the research shows that it can reduce complications due to surgery by 50% in half. It's such a simple process. But of course, many doctors are resistant to using it. So let's take a look at a, v a short clip, just a couple of minutes, on how this was portrayed on ER. Thank you. We have a visitor. Now, remember being asked if Dr. Benton could scrub in for this? I'm a friend of the patient. He asked if I would observe him. Uh-huh. Put him under. Let's do this. Whoa, whoa. What about the checklist? Excuse me? Safe surgery checklist? I've had 10 cases a day, doctor. All the more reason to take the necessary precautions. It'll only take a minute. One minute. John Carter here for a right cadaveric renal allograft. Correct. Does the patient have a known allergy? No. Does anesthesia anticipate a difficult airway? No. Is the risk of bleeding greater than 500 cc's? I sure as hell hope not. Let's go put him under. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody slow down. No, let's just take our time and introduce the room. What's next? We all hold hands and sing Kumbaya? Sheila Lane, scrub nurse. Paula Cheney, circulating nurse. Kay Schumacher, anesthesiologist. Randall Okerman, chief surgical resident. Ethan Dean, surgical intern. Peter Benton, observing general surgeon. Any concerns from the surgical team? Oh my God, you're wasting my time. Any nursing concerns? We don't have any reperfusion solution. We won't be needing it. I'll have some sent up. Were any antibiotics given in the last 60 minutes? Just starting them now. Ten blade. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you run the antibiotics prior to incision, you cut the risk of infection by half. Dr. Benton? You're a guest here, and I don't like guests. As a friend of the patient, you're welcome to sit, observe, and shut up. Template. The anastomoses are complete. Releasing the clamp. Suture lines look good, no leaks. I have a PDS for the ureter. Shouldn't it be pinking up by now? What happened to sitting quietly in the corner, Dr. Benton? No, seriously, shouldn't it be? Sometimes it takes a minute. I don't have a parenchymal pulse. Crap. We've got an arterial thrombosis. Reclamp and take down the sutures. Satinsky, please. Where's the clot? Renal artery is obstructing the blood flow. Gonna have to take it out and start all over again. Problem solved. Flush with heparin saline and reperfusion solution. Reperfusion solution? We've got it. We're all set. Oh, well, it's a good thing we just have some laying around, huh? How long did it take to get the reperfusion solution up from the pharmacy? Fifteen minutes. What happens if you don't have the reperfusion solution? You made your point, doctor? No, I disagree, doctor. I think that this is an excellent teaching opportunity, though. You'd have had 15 minutes of warm ischemia, the organ would have taken a major blow, and there's a good chance we would have ended up with a non-functioning kidney. Wouldn't you agree, doctor? If we're all done teaching here, perhaps some of you would like to assist me in getting this kidney back into the patient's body. Where do you get a copy of that checklist? No, people! So we also do outreach to the public uh, by putting web links on the show's websites. So there, there's a huge fan base for these shows, and people actually go to the show's websites every week. So we embed web links that go to credible sources of health information. And then we track the traffic, and we see huge spikes in traffic when the links are coupled with the storyline. The other thing we do is use transmedia. Henry Jenkins from MIT, who's now at USC, is the guru of transmedia. And he says it's a way of blending or combining traditional media and new media so that viewers have to navigate various platforms to piece a story together. The way we at Hollywood Health and Society use transmedia is to help viewers navigate various platforms to, get, to put their own health picture together. So I'd like to show you an example of a transmedia project. And this was a story on the show Army Wives about traumatic brain injury. So we'll see just a clip of the diagnosis of the brain injury. The functional MRI confirms Needs that we suspected up. Colonel Burton. You're suffering from traumatic brain injury, most likely sustained during your RPG incident in Iraq. Dr. Patterson, I dove behind the Humvee when that RPG went off. And I caught some shrapnel but I was mostly protected from the blast. Not exactly. The energy from that explosion went through the Humvee and through you. It literally rattled your brain. So that was over six months ago. How could I get TBI now? You didn't. 
I suspect the symptoms have always been there. You simply didn't notice them or chose to ignore them. We found that some soldiers with TBI can function well in the field in highly routine tasks. It's when they come home and face the challenges of everyday living that the problems more fully emerge. So this is a short clip to give you an idea. So we worked with the network to place uh, traumatic brain injury medical content on the show's websites. And they embedded this diagnosis clip on their website so viewers could go back at any time and watch how this traumatic brain injury was diagnosed. And then we linked to the CDC's, the health agency's uh, webpage. And they developed a blog so that fans could travel to this page and start telling their own stories. And, and many of these fans self-diagnosed after seeing the show. We helped the show develop a Facebook page on traumatic brain injury. And we also um, developed tweets for them which, on traumatic brain injury, which they sent out to their fan base. And this actress, Wendy Davis, who played Joan as a special treat to us, sent these tweets to her Twitter network, to her fans. So we're getting a lot of health content out there on multiple platforms. And finally, the CDC has their own Twitter network. They're all public health experts, but they sent out tweets telling people to watch the show to learn about traumatic brain injury. So there are all these cross linkages. So this is how we use transmedia. Hollywood Health Society also does outreach to policymakers. And so last year, we had an event on Capitol Hill held at the Library of Congress. And we had over 100 guests attend. We had six congressional offices, nine US agencies, and over 10 nonprofit organizations there. And we took with us Dr. Neil Baer, who is the executive producer of Law and Order SVU, and Mariska Hargitay, who you see here, who plays Detective Olivia Benson on the show. And we showed clips just like we're showing today, but they were all global health storylines. And we talked about global health to educate Congress about what's happening around the world. And that the goal was uh, to encourage them to sustain or increase funding for global health programs. We also do a lot of research and evaluation. These are some of the types. So for example, we have a Hollywood Health and Society TV monitoring project. So what we do is, according to Nielsen ratings, we take the top 10 scripted shows for three different ethnic groups, general audience, African American, and Hispanic. The blue boxes are the ones that these shows share in common. So they're, they're in the top 10 across all three groups. And then there are others that two groups share in common. So the aggregate is about 20 shows per year. And we analyze them for about 70 different health topics. We, we train students in how to watch the shows and use these checklists to code for all of the health content they see. And then we do an analysis to see what health topics we're actually seeing in the most popular shows. So in 2010, if you see this pie chart, violence you know, was nearly half of the storylines. And then there are a lot of other health topics like physical disability, heart disease, unintentional injury, substance abuse. And we've consulted on many of these, but not all of them. We were really interested in global health. So we, we did the same kind of content analysis in 2009. And we found out that less than 2% of all of the storylines on those top 20 scripted shows addressed global health topics. And so we worked really hard over the span of a year and a year later, we increased the number of global health storylines by 300%. So it went from 9 to 26. And we're still working. And that's actually one of the reasons we're here today with some writers and producers who you'll meet in a minute to inspire them by what they see and learn here in South Africa. I'm not going to show any more clips because we have other clips to show you. But Law and Order SVU uh, does a lot of global health content with us. And 
Neil, Neil Baer, their executive producer, has a huge following on Twitter. And he uses something called the bubble tweet. And that's what the circle is here. I'd have to be online to show it to you, and, I, and I'm not connected here. But um, basically, you, it's like receiving a regular uh, tweet. And you click on that little bubble, and you see 30 seconds of video. So if, you're, if you have an upcoming episode or series, and you want to call your fans' attention to it, it's a great way to engage them with just a little highlight of what they're going to see. <coughs> Pass on that. So uh, we consulted on a, a storyline about HIV on The Bold and the Beautiful. And it was about this young man, Tony, who discovers in one episode he's HIV positive. In another episode, he tells his fiancee, Kristen, and they later get married and have a baby. And it was, so this, the messages from our experts were about reducing stigma around HIV and about heterosexual transmission of the virus. The network let us air a public service announcement, like an advertisement, a 30-second advertisement, featuring Tony. And Tony refers viewers to a call-in AIDS hotline number. That resulted in the highest peak in calls all year to this hotline, 5,313 calls in a single day. And that's where you can see that highest peak with the red arrow. Now, we tracked all references in the media to this hotline number over the course of a year. So we had our very credible news program, 60 Minutes, our Surgeon General of the United States talking about HIV and referring viewers, MTV, nothing came close to a minor storyline in a daytime soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful. And it really shows the power of dramatic storytelling to motivate people to take action. And finally, we have an extraordinary advisory board. You know, we have a lot of entertainment industry insiders, public health leaders, and academics, and they're really key to our success. We have a partnership with the Writers Guild of America West, and the president of the Writers Guild is the co-chair of my board. And that president changes every three years. But it's, it's built into their bylaws so that we always have a partnership with the Writers Guild. So we know that what we call entertainment education saves lives, improves health, and enhances well-being globally. So thank you. That was um, my summary of the Hollywood Health and Society program. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. I'd like to start with Carol Barbie. Carol is originally an actress. She's now an accomplished producer, writer, and showrunner. She's written shows such as Providence, Judging Amy, and Jericho. Carol also served as executive producer of the CBS show Swingtown and created the medical drama Three Rivers. She is currently a consulting producer on the series Hawaii Five-0. Next, we have Harriet Perlman. Ms. Perlman is a senior executive at the Seoul City Institute for Health and Development. Harriet has been in the field of entertainment and education for the past 30 years as a trainer, publisher, scriptwriter, story editor, and executive producer. She has worked at the Seoul City Institute for the past 11 years. Next up is John Max Burnett III. Max started out acting and directing in theater before moving to LA and turning his attention to writing. Max is currently co-creator and executive producer of The Troop, a children's series on Nickelodeon. His pilot script for this series won a Writers Guild of America Award. He is also working on a pilot for another series for the Cartoon Network, as well as a feature film script for Mad Chance Films. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Makamo Mamabolo. Ms. Mamabolo has been working as an actress for the past 10 years on television, in film, and on stage. She has also produced, directed, and written a variety of programs. She now has her own production company, Pupa, Pupa, sorry, <laughs> Productions, and I'm going to take lessons afterwards, where she is the co-executive producer. Next, I'd like to present Karen Tenkoff, currently a development partner at Walt Disney Feature Animation. Ms. Tenkoff has worked in a variety of impressive roles, 
including working as film producing partner to Robert Redford, with whom she produced The Horse Whisperer, The Legend of Bagger Vance, and The Motorcycle Diaries, among other exceptional projects. Ms. Tenkoff is also a writer and has sold a screenplay of her own. Her work emphasizes family films and quality, quality storytelling to reach diverse audiences. And last, but definitely not least, I'd like to introduce Harriet Gavshan, one of South Africa's most experienced producers. She is co-founder and executive producer of Curious Pictures, one of South Africa's most innovative film and television production companies. An award-winning producer, Harriet has developed an expertise in creating drama, which has targeted social function, but remains primetime entertainment. She's been central in developing three AIDS education drama series for Johns Hopkins Health Education South Africa. There are more detailed biographies in your packets, so please read them when you go home. And please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists. So I'm going to uh, turn the mic over to Carol Barbie. Hi. First of all, just thank you so much for hosting us. We are having an amazing trip here. Writers are always looking for stories, and we're always really grateful when people tell us theirs. So we really appreciate everybody who's been talking to us and everything that we've seen. It's been amazing, and we look forward to going back and hopefully putting some of those on screen. Um, I think I'm supposed to set up the clip that they're going to show from uh, uh, my series, Three Rivers. Um, Three Rivers was a, was a, um, a one-hour drama for CBS in the United States about organ, donat uh, organ transplants. It was a story, uh, one organ donation was told uh, in each episode, and we told that story from three points of view. The doctors, the donors, and the recipients. And we would tell each of those stories, and at one point in the story, they would all come together and result in a transplant, and we would see what happened afterwards. So. This is a scene that takes place when the procurement doctors have flown to the hospital to procure an organ, and uh, you'll see some of what the doctors end up having to um, handle because it's a very emotional time for all the families. Hello? Are you one of the vultures who came to pick my daughter apart? For the record, your daughter was gone before we were caught. You're making a terrible mistake. Not for us, but for yourself. How do you figure that? Because no one ever regrets saying yes. 90% of the people who say no, they're, they're haunted by that decision. It's the one thing they could have done to keep some part of their loved one alive. To honor that person, they didn't do. We don't get a commission for the organs we bring back. We're trying to save a man's life, that's why we're here. I'm sorry about your daughter. I said the most awful things to her this morning. I tried to talk her out of going through with the wedding. Told her she was turning her back on her family the way she was raised. I pray she forgives me. I feel like I didn't even know her. I stopped listening, so she stopped telling me things. I could fill you in on the last year. Then maybe you can tell me about everything before. 
for that. Guys, guys, we're back on. Mother changed her mind. The judge lifted the order. Perfect. Okay, you guys, come on, let's go. Go where? We should wait until the storm passes. Kim's crashing. We need to take those organs now. They're closing the bridge. We can't get to the airport. Is there a landing strip on this island? Yeah. Start the surgery. I'll get us a ride back. How are you planning on... That's my problem, okay? Trust me. Okay, okay. This is a storyline um, where the mother had unresolved issues with her daughter who had died that morning uh, at her wedding. There was a, a shooting at her wedding. And the mother had been against the wedding, and she, um, and what we had found when we spoke to a lot of our doctors and our recipients and our, our donor families is that sometimes the hardest decision to, to, to go forward with a transplant and say, yes, I'll donate my loved one's organs, it's hard to do that because you feel like it's all over. You'll never be able to say goodbye. You'll never be able to say, I'm sorry. You'll never be able to resolve issues with that person. And, and in order to be a donor, the, the patient has to be brain dead. And a lot of people mistake that for being in a coma and they think they are going to wake up, which they're not. So a, a lot of what the doctors have to do and the procurement people have to do is to gently um, explain the situation medically and also explain the good that it will do for the families. Uh, not only the family that's receiving the organ, but, but the family that's, that has lost someone. It's really the only good outcome when you've lost a loved one. So we, we, they see it as they're, they're doing them a service by explaining this to them. So that's what this storyline was about. Um, it's a privilege to tell stories for a living. Um, and um, I've never felt more privileged than when I was asked to create a medical show, and that was Three Rivers, and I, I spent a lot of time in some of the top transplant hospitals in the country, and doctors were very generous with their time and their stories. We flew in a lot of doctors and nurses and donor families to speak with our writing staff. Every story we did was based on a true story, um, it's not our job as writers um, to educate. It's not our job is to entertain. Well, actually, our job is to make money for our corporate overlords. But after that, um, our job is to do that by entertaining somebody. Um, but uh, contrary to what you may have heard or what you may believe, Hollywood is filled with people who care deeply about a lot of things. And when we get the opportunity to do something that matters, We'll, we'll take you up on it. So, um, so this was a real privilege for me. Um, we were on the air for 13 weeks. Uh, we had between eight and 9,000, sometimes 10,000, 10, I'm sorry, 10 million viewers each week for 13 weeks. Um, in that time, the amount of registration to be donors in our country went up almost 10%. And um, we had several documented cases of transplants that took place because of people seeing the television show. Um, I was telling Sandra that um, literally the day, I'd gotten a lot of emails and phone calls along the way, which are just wonderful and really keep you going when you're fighting um, said corporate overlords to try to do your job. And um, I'd gotten a lot of emails and, and phone calls from different people saying thank you and they were really touched by storylines. But literally the day um, they called me from CBS to say that they were taking us off the air, um, I got an email that afternoon and it was from a, a, a woman and she said, I just want to thank you because my daughter got a heart last night because her donor watched your show last Sunday. And um, it was that direct of an impact. And so um, that's a good day at the office. So anytime we can do something like that, we look forward to doing it. And uh, hopefully this trip is going to result in, in some version of that. So thank you. I'm going to ask one. Go ahead. I'm going to ask one question of each panelist, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. So. Carol, you've created TV shows in Hollywood, you've run shows in Hollywood, and you've worked on many shows in Hollywood. And so what's the trick for staying passionate about your work in such a high-stress field? Wow, that's a, that is a good question. Um, for me, I think it's different for everybody, uh, but for me, what I've really started to, 
to see is that I can have a good time writing on a lot of different shows and I do not want to underplay how important it is to fight crime in Hawaii, people. This is important <laughs> stuff. But, um, but when it comes right down to it, it's a very difficult job. It's hard to do, it's hard to do a television show. It's, it's hard. It's hard to keep them on the air. It's hard to keep them going. It's a difficult job. And for me, um, I need a larger purpose for doing it every day. And sometimes that's just making sure 300 people stay employed. But for, for me, it's particularly with, with a show like Three Rivers, I really saw the impact and, uh, and that that I think I've now chosen the next show that I'm working on actually continues in that vein and it, and it is about driving community involvement and um, I'm excited to do that. Thank you so much. And now we'll, we'll hear from Harriet Perlman and she'll tell us a little bit about the clip we're going to see. It's great to be here and to be part of this panel. Thanks so much. I'd like to just make four points which I'd like to add to the debate and discussion uh, of this evening. Firstly, I'd just like to introduce uh, Soul City, the organization that I'm uh, working with. Soul City has been at the forefront of weaving health and development issues into prime time television dramas. Social dramas in this country have developed substantially since Soul City began 17 years ago and have become part of the fabric of television programming with many quality local drama series being produced with large audiences viewing them who are hungry for local content. Soul City works primarily in South Africa reaching about 27 million people but also with local partners beyond our borders in nine other Southern African countries. Entertainment for social purposes entertainment education, development communication, whatever name you want to call it, is not new and it's been used throughout the world over centuries in the arts, in theater, in film, and specifically in the 70s in the field of public health. Soul City doesn't only use mass media TV programs but integrates these with other elements as part of a wider health campaign these include different platforms, primetime dramas for children and adults, booklets, children's clubs, and on the ground community programs. So I want to raise four points about the work that we do. First point, good entertainment education is also quality dramatic storytelling. It's not simply a good drama with an annoying message tagged on at the end. For example, someone in a soap opera who uses a condom, which wouldn't be a bad idea though. Um, but through a rigorous research process, the complexities of change are integrated into the fabric of the drama itself. So the principles of social and behavior change, etc., that we use in public health discourse are no different to the principles of good drama. You want emotional characters audience identifying with them, you want to create believable journeys where characters confront choice under pressure with themselves, in their relationships, and in their wider social environment. The second point I want to make is that mass media entertainment does have the potential to contribute to meaningful social change, but to be effective it must be research-based. And that must include formative audience research with your audience and testing storylines with them as well. Because very often you think you know what the problem is, you think you know what the issue is, and in reality, that health topic or that health message is quite different to what the real need on the ground is. For example, you may want to do HIV prevention and promote condom use, but in fact you find that the reason in a community people aren't using condoms is at the clinic has run out of stock every month and nurses refused to treat teenage girls. So actually your storyline is around the right to effective health services. Thirdly, I just want to make the point that we need to promote collective action as a solution to health issues and not only individual agency, which is actually quite a challenge for script writers. And for greater impact, we also need to link our programs into a wider social movements for change. For example, in, in 2007, with our partner program in Mozambique, 
They joined a campaign as part of 35 organizations which set up to advocate for a new domestic violence bill. As part of this campaign, we produced a film based on local research which told a story about a powerful man from a small fishing community who continually beat his wife. No one had the courage to do anything. A key turning point in the story is when women in the village take community action with their collective economic power and refuse to buy his catch. So Matt's media entertainment programs in Mozambique that were produced as part of this campaign played a key role in sparking interest and debate and getting the messages out there. And this whole movement successfully facilitated the passing of a new domestic violence legislation in June 2009. And now final point, that our stories need to move away from only imparting accurate health messages to also creating debate about wider social and cultural norms. Those are those entrenched values that hinder or help people to make healthy choices for themselves. And so the clip that I want to show you is from a short film we did called Umchato, The Wedding. Many people in marriages get HIV from partners who have secret sexual partners on the side. This is fueled by cultural norms that entrench values and practices that it's okay for men to have more than one partner and that married women must obey their husbands. So the shift in the field of public health that we've made from looking at individual change to an awareness of how social and economic and cultural norms influence behavior, we need to make that shift into our dramas as well and create stories where these norms and ideas are being actively debated. Um, Charter was also part of a, a much wider campaign across nine countries which was addressing the issue of concurrent partners. So, in summary, we want to integrate messages. Yes, we want to portray health accurately. It's certainly important, but it's not an end in itself. If the intention is to affect social change, we need to link our programs as well with wider campaigns and entertain by also generating public debate and discourse so that these ideas and the choices that people face are part of a wider campaign that they see around them. So we'll just show that clip. Mm -hmm. Now I was on the Because the morning sickness, the three months pregnant. Mama get caught dumb. Telephone. Yes, but for now we're done. Some cattle are lumped down here, but now we're going to jump. long. No, because we're going to have 
Ingolo yanto only nini zai? Abantu ba koma me so pansi. Ningole lan. I'm kulo akona njenga to si lungi sa. Akona. Si shaza man. Choice. Ya bona ngoko ya shaza. Shaza nina ngo. Ti shaza nina mna ngo. Apa pansi kseki songa me sa stenga sumi nomanz. Owa wanti ba mas ma kosmo pi. Kote man shaza nina. Owa kulo ngos kalega kubu mchele na tinjalo. Kuba yonge le do nyani. Is that what I come to sound emotional soon? Then deserve a lendo. Who need that so called? Who my cause I own daughter, you call a mosu tandan and you don't bazaar, and I saw the change on the inlaw. Daddy, to daddy, to go, Mamelab. This are what he can like um quenyan, a cuba, we are cupayan. Hm? Sound be my lengua and say phone alone, no more answer. I call Nick some phone alone. Phone alone, Danny Lapago. Aike, uli tiwe gei kama lokba unotembe gili. Ya zike ukba ukba mfaze. Hagululang. Kunzi ima. Kuna kunye meze ele sisi. Wiki nye kaka. Uli shile gei kaya lako. Uzo uzi masa. Lomzi wako mahambu. Ya zike ukba indote ya lo nicho. Inta kwa ye kaya. Indote ya peke. I pagel. You've worked for so many years on entertainment education. I'm wondering if you could just share what, what is one of the most inspiring experiences you've had in the field? Um. <laughs> Um, I'd like to say that Holly, who is the director of this film, is in the audience. Um, yeah, it's a very beautiful film. <laughs> so maybe that can be my answer. That's my inspiration. I think working on this film was enormously inspiring. But I also think that watching young talent grow and assisting people with skills and with opportunities to try and grow the industry is something that is really inspiring and exciting. And I hope even in the current economic climate where a lot of funding is, is in fact drying up, that we can find those resources actually to continue with those kinds of skills and capacity building programs. Thank you, Harriet. And now we're going to hear from Max, Max John Burnett III, who goes by Max and created the show The Troop would you like to do a quick intro of your clip? So this is the part where we go from the very inspirational to the completely ridiculous. <laughs> um, I do a TV show called The Troop, which is on Nickelodeon, about three kids who battle monsters. So unless you are uh, dealing with a medical problem of a plague of ice zombies, uh, some of this is a little bit challenging. So I'll just uh, let it speak for itself and we'll go from there after that. Did you see a man with an extreme case of frostbite? definitely an ice school behind all this. Yes, he's turning everyone into ice zombies. He'll feed off their energy and then destroy them. So the whole school is at risk? Maybe the world. That's why we gotta stop them before they get out of Lakewood High. I... He won't be doing anything. International sending over a placement unit. There's no time. We've got six hours to destroy the ice school or everyone will be stuck as ice zombies forever. What do you think International will say about that? <laughs> What are you guys doing? We have to get to the skating rink and fast before the ice school turns the whole town into zombies. How do we get this over there? Come on. How'd they find us? 
find us so fast? Seems they had a guy. Mr. Stockley, how could you? Most people don't look good as a zombie, but it's kind of pulling it off. We're totally surrounded. We're never going to get out of here. Then we just lost Lakewood. What are you doing? I figure if we're going out, I might as well go out in style. Even if we blast them all, more will come, and we'll never get out of here. You know, the one nice thing about zombies is they lower the temperature. It's nice and cool. What? Can't we be both in danger and refreshed? You know what? A real troop member would do something really bold and unexpected right now. So the question after watching that would be the same one that I have, why am I here? <laughs> um, and actually, when I uh, found out about this program, I immediately wanted to apply for it, uh, not because I do medical dramas or um, even in children's television in the United States, almost uh, none of the children's programming wants you to do anything educational. So, uh, But what I also do is I write um, science fiction uh, feature films. And a lot of my science fiction feature films, especially lately, the ones that I'm working on, um, deal with sort of end of the world issues of like what happens if humanity goes to the brink and then what do we do? Do we make mistakes and then fail and lose a large portion of our population or do we uh, pull back from the brink? And the reason I think that those type of stories and the reason why I wanted to come out here is uh, when I grew up, I grew up in Oklahoma, which is a very rural uh, area of the United States, and I grew up in a very impoverished area um, on a goat farm, which makes me very happy as I drove around and saw all the goats, because I really love them. Um, but uh, I have a picture that I, hang, that I have in my closet, and so as I dress each day, I see it, and it's of me and my best friends from fifth grade. We're all about 10, 11 years old. And uh, there's four of us, and of the four, that are there, uh, one of them is in prison for the third time for stealing cars. Uh, one of them is a meth addict. I don't know if you have a meth problem or if you know meth over here, but over in the United States in rural America, it's a huge, huge problem. You bake it yourself. It's very inexpensive, but extremely addictive. Um, and the third one, and as I grew up, I didn't know that it, uh, his father uh, beat him severely on a regular basis. And when at 22, on his 22nd birthday, he shot himself, unable to deal with the history of that. So, these are all problems that come out of rural America, at least for my rural America. And so I've always been fascinated with the idea, what do you do when you come to those moments of, uh, of being on the brink? And globally right now, I feel, I mean, especially when you look at the economic crisis that we've been dealing with, um, world hit health issues definitely, but also what I believe is uh, climate change, which is affecting things drastically. You've got uh, more violent storms, which if you have a hurricane that hits, and especially in a tropical area, you could have a, suddenly a massive outbreak of cholera, which could or could not, depending on what resources they have, wipe out even further uh, the population. And that sort of stuff interests me because I think that we as a group, as a, as, as a global, as, you know, global humans, as, we are uh, sort of on the precipice of what are we going to do. And um, so usually in my stories, in, in the feature films that I write, of course, you know, the world doesn't succeed very well. Uh, it's because at my heart I'm a bit of a pessimist. Um, but my brother makes fun of me because even when I'm jumping over the cliff, I, cliff, he always says that I have like a pinky full of hope that I hold on to the edge, not falling over. Um, and so I have to say that as uh, I have been going around into uh, clinics like the one I saw today, um, and especially at a time when your country is rebuilding itself, reforming, uh, and, and becoming something what I think is quite extraordinary in the face of, you know, all these other issues that are, that are systemic, that it has given me so much hope, because I see the hope on everybody's faces that are working, the, the, the people that are getting, receiving the help, and so I have to say for me, at least this trip, um, it has taken my pinky full of hope and maybe given me a little bit more, so thank you.
Max, thank you. Um, well, your perspective as a creator of children's programs is unique. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the changing world of children's programming. Um, when I was growing up, you had uh, Saturday morning cartoons. That's all that existed. Um, you had PBS where you had, in the afternoon, some educational programming. Um, and then, because there was a lot of violence on the Saturday morning cartoons, uh, the, the, our, our Congress, our, our leaders passed legislation that said you had to have some sort of educational content. So we did. We had things like Schoolhouse Rock, which talked about grammar. We had the other things that also talked about polluting the world, that kind of stuff. And that's the world that I grew up in. But now with cable and 24-hour access and all that kind of stuff, uh, you see that Kids TV, there's now three networks, 24-7. And of those three networks, Disney, uh, Cartoon Network, and uh, Nickelodeon, who I work for, um, they have like five or six channels within themselves. Some of them teens, they focus on kids, that kind of stuff. But they're not interested in, um, uh, as far as your programming, uh, doing specific things on you know, issues, whether it's environment, um, health issues, world health, health issues. So that's, you know, if you want to tell a story, you have to really make it super entertaining because that's what they want. They want to do that and because they want the kids to tune in and then buy sugar corn snacks or whatever the latest Barbie is. Um, but they, one thing that they do do, and I'm seeing this specifically with Nickelodeon, uh, Cartoon Network picked up, I don't know if, I don't know if Disney does it as much because I don't watch Disney as much. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they do big PSAs, like we just had one, the big help where you go and you help your environment and they take the stars and they do these public service announcements, these little commercials, and sometimes they do a whole day. Like they also deal with childhood obesity. They have this, pro this program where, I mean, it's not that much, but for one Saturday, they, they stop programming. So they turn off the thing and literally, if you tune into Nickelodeon, it says, go outside and play. So for one, the rest of the year, you eat sugar snacks and uh, enjoy that sort of stuff. But for that one day, you're supposed to go out and, and play. But at least that's something. And, and uh, because they are trying to feed the uh, commercial overlords of Disney or Viacom or whoever it may be. So that's a big difference. Thank you, Max.